So um, I have family members that uh, really enjoy uh, the crust of pizza just slathered in butter as a treat. Uh, we call them pizza bones, like the leftover crust, because no, nobody eats the bone. Nobody eats the bones, right? Nobody eats the uh, uh, the crusts. So you just save those, slather them in butter, have them as a treat. Do you have stuffed crusts in in the U.S.? Well, I think that's where they started, right? Pizza Hut, Pizza Hut just like started making everybody a gavone, and just like you know, hey, cheese on top, cheese no. inside. Yes. Like like right around, you know, like like cheese stuffed crust. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Oh, it's and and so you have that locally, or is that like a, a chain or franchise oriented uh, thing? Uh, we have pizza in the UK, but oh. other non-franchised uh, pizza parlors also do stuffed crust. Ooh, nice. Um, I'm not saying I wouldn't eat it. I'm just saying. So, um, welcome. Meeting of the Minds. My name's Christopher Mowdy. We're starting a little bit late. Um, actually, we're not starting too late. It's only nine after. We started this about nine minutes ago, perfectly on time with a couple of technical difficulties that I blame on the internet gods uh, that I don't believe in. So, Dr. Hunt, did I, did I call you Matthew Steele? No. Okay, uh, because, I, 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 because I happen to have an, uh, a dialogue open with Matthew Steele, uh, and the last thing I would want to do is confuse you with Matthew Steele because I hate him, but I like you. So... Dr. Hunt, could you please explain, as concisely as you can, um, what kind of research you do? Well, I have two avenues of research. Uh, one, I'm employed by the Un University of Bath in the Mechanical Engineering Department, working on the motion of two paths in five-axis CNC machines. Uh, that's what I do for my day job, and for a hobby, I continue my work on fluid dynamics with external fields, so electrohydrodynamics, magnetohydrodynamics, um, and I'm also doing some flow and curved pipes, which is proven to be quite tricky. Um, but I, I'm working with other people on these sort of things. Um, I'm working with a guy in Sheffield working on uh, waves on the sun. And I'm working with a colleague in France, uh, extending my PhD results, is, is essentially. So that's, that's that's basically what I do. Uh, you're, you've got to unmute. Thank you. If people wanted to find you on Google Scholar, uh, how do you spell your name exactly? M A T T H E W. Uh, uh, that's Matthew and Hunt is about H U N T. But if you just did a Google search for Matt Hunt, applied mathematician, you'd you'd, you'd find me quite easily. Uh, Matt spelt with one T. Excellent. Now, in addition to those jobs, and this is something we alluded to earlier uh, when the technical difficulties occurred. Um, you also have this reputation as a science dude who engages in the great debate and puts forth science claims to refute people who uh, might be putting forth science-ish claims. Well, you say science-ish, but I would call it pseudoscience. Okay. Okay. Like what? Like what do you consider pseudoscience? What are some of those categories? Um, things like uh, evolution isn't possible because of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, the universe universe couldn't have come from nothing because of the first law of thermodynamics. That sort of gibberish. So uh, it's basically trying to correct a complete misunderstanding of um, what physics actually is. Um, Dr. Hunt? I would like you to take an opportunity to talk about what the misunderstandings of of the first law of thermodynamics and then correct them. 
and then the misunderstandings of the second law of thermodynamics. Well, I mean, correct them. Uh, well, there there are four laws of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. um, the zeroth law uh, effectively defines what temperature is. Um, so, for example, if you have three bodies, call them A, B, and C. A and B are in thermal e equilibrium. A and C are in thermal equilibrium. That implies that B and C are in thermal equilibrium. Now, thermal e equilibrium is is where there's there's no um, no net flow of heat, and therefore you have a a unique temperature for that for for that system. So that's how you get the idea of temperature coming in from the zeroth law. The first law of thermodynamics is uh, effectively conservation of energy for a process. Um, so that's something which a lot of people don't understand. Um, and then the second law is all about heat engines. It's um, it's all about the efficiency of, of heat engines. So uh, th th this second law basically states that you cannot have a process whose sole purpose is to turn heat into work. That's it. When you say that the first law of thermodynamics is based on process, that obviously no, makes no, some... It's, it's not based on a process. It's for a process. So you have things like... Um, uh, fridge, for example, you have you can you can look at the conservation of energy for um, the cooling of, of of air, for example, to get refrigeration. But you can't apply that wholesale to the entire universe, for example. And another thing which really uh, gets at my nose is people apply these wholesale for lots of different scales. So they apply it for the classical scale, which is perfectly fine, because thermodynamics is all about the uh, heat engines. It was done in the 19th century by Maxwell and others, Kelvin and Helmholtz and stuff. They all had, were looking at heat engines, um, boilers, that kind of thing, railway trains, that sort of thing, to get energy to try and understand that type of of, of process. A lot of creationists take these things and apply them, say, at the quantum scale when they're not applicable. Um, so there's, there's the idea from, uh, from classical physics, which is thermodynamics, and then you get statistical mechanics, which, which deal more in the, the quantum realm. And you can, there are these people who are working on something called quantum thermodynamics, which, I don't, which I'm not too sure about. But to, to apply the, um, the thermodynamics of, of Maxwell and, and others at all scales is completely wrong. Well, you just laid out a, a pretty damning um, use of uh, the laws of thermodynamics for the purpose of creationist claims. Uh, because you laid out the history of you know where they came from and the misapplication of, of how they're used. Could you please give a specific example of something that really, uh, as you said, gets up your nose, that gets, gets in your craw as uh, it applies to the uh, laws of thermodynamics? The first law, uh, when they talk about energy, they, they say, okay, um, the first law is basically conservation of energy, therefore the universe couldn't have come, come from nothing. That's one of the things that really winds me up. And, and what would your response be to that? As I said, the first law of thermodynamics is a classical law. It's only applicable for, for heat engines and changing of temperature and things like that on the scale that um, of, 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 of humans. And moreover, um, the thermodynamics that they talk about is what's known as equilibrium thermodynamics. 
So that's also a very specific type of thermodynamics. Um, there are other systems called non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which model reality much better. And of course, they ignore those ideas, which are which are very complex, uh, and go for the for the very simple e equilibrium thermodynamics. So that's one of the things which which also uh, you have to explain to them. But of course, as they've got as 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 they have this book, they say, I can just use things from this book to get my answer. Um, but it, that's that's not the case. You do have to think very very hard about where these laws apply and how you can apply them. You can't just apply them willy willy nilly. Um, so this comes to the point where you have to know your definitions which are used in science because they're very very precise. And a lot of creationists that I've come across don't know this. They don't know the fundamental definitions that they use to apply to science. Uh, and that's one of the reasons which they fail. I would like to take this a little bit more meta, uh, pretty much based on what you just said. Um, what is your opinion of non-experts critiquing experts within a field. And I don't mean experts as in luminaries within that field, but people who have studied at accredited institutions to earn a little bit of bona fides, a little bit of gravitas, a little bit of weight and leverage about what they say about said topic that they have expertise in, as compared to Joe Blow, uh, what are they called, autodidacts. Um, well, it's it's fine. It, no, it, let it all out. Do not hold. Do not contain. I don't want to lit on it. I want to hear the real opinion. Well, it's fine if they know the definitions and they know the theory. Uh, people change fields in science all the time. Uh, so, going from one topic to another topic in say physics isn't unheard of, and it's relatively common. Uh, however, what people don't do in physics is they don't go into a new topic all guns blazing, knowing absolutely nothing about the topic and saying, I know this, I have a book which explains this, it's called the Bible, uh, and, and then saying you're wrong because of this, that and the other. Uh, that I think, that I, I have no time for. Um, but those people who have actually studied uh, the topic, then yes, I, I, I will talk to you. Uh, but those who are utterly ignorant on the topic, but have just heard a few buzzwords, I have really no time for those sort of people, and I treat them appropriately. Um, it makes you sound elitist when you say that. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, because I think a certain amount of elitism is appropriate because no matter what somebody's inclusion criteria are for a social contract to have an intellectual conversation, wh whoever falls outside of that, whoever is excluded, makes those inclusion criteria seem elitist. Yes. So, well, so I mean, talk to that. So I, what they have to be is they have to be willing to learn. And that's the key aspect. Um, no one is... Uh, stupid, but they but but they can be un, untrained and in, intelligent, and when when you get those two things together, you can educate them really quite well. However, if they're um, and we've heard of the uh, Dunning Kruger effect, if they're on the if they're on the lower scale of the Dunning Kruger effect, then blame the Dunning Kruger effect if you don't mind, and if you don't want to, I'll, I'll take care of it. It's up to you. Well, I know. The, the Dunning-Kruger effect, you've got two scales. I mean, those who are exceedingly stupid uh, necessarily think they're perhaps cleverer than they actually are. No, you can't, are. you can't use the word stupid. That's not... <laughs> the, the word stupid had nothing to do with the Dunning-Kruger effect. People who scored lower on one variable of accuracy 
scored it super high on on ratings of um, confidence. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, it's, so, so it's basically um, people thinking they know a lot about a topic when they actually don't, and vice versa. People who actually know a great deal about a topic um, are saying, "Well, I, I perhaps I'm not too sure about this, that, and the other," which seems to indicate that they're not overly confident in their knowledge and not overly confident in in the topic which they're an, an expert on. How important is confidence, in your opinion? Confident, like yeah. I'm super confident about what I think, Doctor. Um, it, it depends. In which context that, that you're doing it, um, I've when when you're, when you're talking to uh, very religious believers, then I think confidence is is very important because you, you've you've got to give the idea that the stuff you're doing isn't cutting edge and it is it's well defined, well researched, well evidenced science that you would do on um, any university degree. Which 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 would you take? So from that respect, can I, can I please interrupt? And I'm so sorry to do so, but when you put it like that, which I totally agree with, when you put it like that, doesn't it make it sound like scientists or the Oracle of Delphi speaking a language that no one understands, and that you know, like people need to climb to a mountain to you know. You know what I'm getting. You, you get yeah, the, the analogy I'm making, right? Yes. It's, it's like scientists don't, they're not, they don't speak normal human language. They are those people. I try and explain my ideas as uh, lucidly as possible, and I agree. Uh, there are some scientists which cannot communicate, which cannot explain what they do. Um, with my stuff, I. I like to try and give simple examples of what I do, which people can and which people can then understand. Excuse me, then understand. And then once they've got the idea around the simple example, then that's something that you can build on. Doctor Hunt, are you an atheist or a theist? I'm an atheist. Do you know other scientists that are not? atheists? Yes. Are they really good scientists? Yes. Are they really, really good scientists? Yes. Okay. However, so, what, oh. they don't, what they don't do yes. is they use uh, the supernatural as part of their research. Science relies on method, methodol methodological naturalism which means they can only study natural effects. And the scientists who are very good adhere to that um, like, like law, if, if you like. And then you get the other people, and we, and we call them creation scientists, who try and bring the supernatural into science by redefining the underlying philosophy of science. Uh, and we call those creation scientists. And... In, 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 in essence, they're not scientists. They've become theologians, in my opinion. Well, um, can you talk a little bit about methodological naturalism, specifically how it's different from philosophical naturalism, as you understand it? Well, you can, well my understanding of methodological naturalism basically means you only study natural effects for phenomena. For example, lightning, for example, is an excellent uh, way to describe it. Previously, um, Greeks thought that uh, Zeus was responsible for lightning, uh, and that would be their exp explanation. Nowadays, we understand, via the laws of electromagnetism, how lightning is created, and we, we have our explanation independent of any supernatural deity. So, but that Which doesn't... is wrong, because Zeus is mad at us. Yes. Uh, which doesn't exclude the, um, the idea of the deity or Zeus actually doing this. It just says, 
look, this is lightning. We can just describe exactly how it works. We can predict it. We can see what sort of patterns they have. Uh, it has, and we generally understand it and can predict it. And we have lots of data which corresponds to the experiments that we've made. Uh, that's methodological naturalism. Philosophical naturalism, as I understand it, is you say there are there is no supernatural. It's all natural. There are no uh, deities or fairies or elves or anything like that, which which meddle in with reality, i.e., magic. So, wait a second. I believe that. I'm a philosophical naturalist. Are you a philosophical naturalist, Doctor Hun? I am. Wait a second. You're proving their. We are proving their point. There is no difference between philosophical and methodological naturalism. Prove me wrong. Go. Well, I th I think it's it's pretty it's 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 pretty obvious that they're the same to me because if the supernatural did exist, then we can see that the and if they do interact with with reality, their interactions are so weak that we can actually we can't measure the actual um, effect that they have. Or if, or they can't interact with reality itself. So, from my, from my point of view, I can just say, well, their their effect is negligible, so I ignore it. Or they can't interact with reality, so I can ignore that as well. So I might as well assume philosophical nat naturalism as my uh, ruling paradigm. Yeah, but. <laughs> Yeah, you just implicated yourself, and then talked yourself out of that implication. Uh, and that—that's how I saw what you just did. You're just like, well, to me, they're the same thing. For this reason, I'm going to add nuance in such a way that they're completely different. And that's why they're the same thing. You got to be kidding me! I mean, because we both admit that there there are um 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 non-philosophical naturalists or um, uh, philosophical metaphysicalists or supernaturalists that we work with. I am the only atheist in my lab. And everybody around me that I call a colleague is the best at what they do. And I love them and rely on them for their ability to not be like, God did it. Well, yeah. Um, when I was working with my supervisor, a lot of the people in my department, my fellow postgraduates, were atheists. They weren't theists at all. Um, and when I was working in for, for the government, a lot of the people I was working with, they were atheists too. They were doing physics, and they were atheists. There were some theists, but they were few and far between. And the ones that you did encounter, uh, did that um, detract their ability to perform science? I mean, one of the principal investigators at the center I work at is uh, an observant Jew, such that, you know, he, he needs to be home by sundown on Friday and this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. And he is a pioneer in his field. He understands how evolution works. He accepts it. Not only does he accept it, he allows it to inform the theories that he puts forth, and he's really good at it. He's really, really, really yes, good at it. You can get a, a separate way of thinking about theology and science. And if you can separate those two, fine. I don't have a problem with you. But my, my problem comes into the case where you allow them what to... Are you saying you have a problem with me? I'm just I, have, I have no problem. So... <laughs> So the only problem I have is when they start interacting with each other. Yes. When the science starts interacting with the theology. That's when I step in and say, whoa. Well, that, that's the reason why I wanted to talk, you, uh, talk to you about the uh, methodological and philosophical naturalism component because that is my, that's my entree into talking to people who want to in, uh, interject supernatural variables into the scientific method. And I, you know, very recently I've used this example. Uh, 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 science is a tool, an instrument, 
defined by certain criteria in the same sense that you can use a hammer to uphold a, a corner of your coffee table mm. it's still a hammer but it's now functioning as a coffee table leg yeah. you know what I mean so yeah. it's, it's it's so science when you try to interject things that don't meet its criteria like supernatural variables it's like bringing um, a baseball bat to a football game. There's no such thing as a football bat. Just yeah. call it something else. Yeah, and something which that really, and I, I think this also goes to what do you call su su supernaturalism. If you said you talk about the var the supernatural variables, but when I think of 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 soup of supernatural, I automatically think of. Um, Personal, um, personal uh, uh, beings who have their own will. So, like um, supernatural fairies. Fairies would would have their own will and can do things what they like and when they like and change the, the laws of science like that. So, so in in that case, you you, you can't have any supernatural variables. Because you have no idea how the fairy is going to uh, to to act from from one point to to the next. So you 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 have I, a Matt, you're, you're preaching to the choir, and I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I've recently had this discussion, and and really um, uh, theists that I really respect, like Nate Cumming. Cunningham has come at me uh, for saying that saying that there is a supernatural variable is a science stopper. And he's like, no, it's not. You could ask this, that, and the other. And I'm like, yeah, but let, let me tell you how it works from my perspective. If at the end of one of my studies, I said that any of the variables any of the variables included, any variables uh, included in the conclusion, um, or anything were supernatural, where would I go next? Not knowing how to measure that. It has ended science. It's due to this thing I can't measure anymore. You have to believe me. Thank you. What do you do? You you can't go you can't go anywhere. So you, I agree with you that you've absolutely stopped science. But I, I still think that su the um, I'll call them entities for the time being. Uh, these personal entities or these uh, entities with the, their own personal will. Um, you as I said before, you can't really involve them. Because their actions will change from one point to the next. There's, there's no, uh, you, you can't write down the law of how they, of how they will react to this, that, and the other. It's, it's just like uh, our, our own personal will. We can do anything that we like. So when, when you talk about supernatural, the supernatural like that, then you have um, a real problem because you just can't write anything down. So I think the idea of supernatural variables is a non-starter from the very, very beginning. Well, one of the arguments, so let me let me play devil's advocate just for a second because um, something that I'm charmed uh, about is the idea that, um, and, and I'm going to bastardize this, I think it was a Arthur C. Clarke or Isaac Asimov who said something like any valid technology or science of today would seem like magic to people of yesterday. You know what I mean? Uh, that is not a quote. It's a paraphrasing. I'm sure the quote is much more eloquent. Yeah, than... I, I, I think the quote is any sufficiently advanced uh, technology is indistingu indistinguishable from magic. Thank you. So that's perfect. Um, what what do we have to say about science 500 years from now? Um, the, I, I think we can just take a time slot and say... What, within, what, within the context of the supernatural, right? Because, because uh, of course, we understand the point that I'm making is um, the science of 500 years from now 
to us would look like we were studying the supernatural potentially it's not a given it's a it's an option potentially but i think potentially not because since we've made a, a number of discoveries things like quantum theory um, electromagnetism uh, special relativity uh, and various uh, electronics and solid solid states we can build on a huge amount and I think we can recognize it as technology now uh, rather than uh, magic but I think the people from 500 years ago will see the technology we have today and and will think it's magic. I mean, for example, um, levitation. 500 years ago, that would have been th thought of as witchcraft. And now, when you get things like the maglev and superconducting magnets, where the things levitate, then I think you'll get people thinking, oh, they're doing magic. But I think now we understand this more, I don't think the technology of 500 years in the future will look like magic to us. We won't say, oh, it's magic. I think, mm -hmm. I think we'll understand that it is technology. You know, I think that you've already proven that I need your address so that I can send the um, a pitchfork and uh, burners to your crib because you are a witch engaging in magic, saying that <laughs> Magnets allow levitation. Magnets. <laughs> Wait, you're serious. Yeah, maglevs. Uh, have, you, have you heard what of the maglev from in 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 China? Mm -mm. Um, Fill us in. Well, it's it's basically a le a levitating train. It has no wheels. It basically works on huge super superconducting magnets. Oh yeah, um, and there, aren't there I, some um, aren't there some roller coasters based on that technology that facilitate uh, moving the carriage forward based on ma magnetic um, resistance? Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Like Great Adventure, I think. Uh, you know, I live in um, you know, I live yeah. near Jersey, Philadelphia. I think Six Flags Great Adventure has like a Batman themed. <laughs> Um, uh, roller coaster that is based on this technology that you're talking about. Yes, it, it it probably does. It's it's got commercial viability. People can go to China and see that this wonderful maglev. Uh, it's it's just a wonderful piece of tech and technology. And there are other um, things that you can uh, see on YouTube um, of this of this thing. What appears to be floating on this rail around, and it's all done via super con superconductivity and, and things like that. That I think is absolutely absolutely amazing. Um, but if people from five hundred years ago saw that, they would automatically assume that it was magic. In my opinion, if people from five hundred years ago listened to you talk, Matthew Hunt. You would be a god, or a witch, or a wizard, or a druid, whatever. But in current times, Doctor Hunt, you are a god to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start wrapping it up because we only have a little bit of time left. Um, are there any final comments that you wanted to make? I mean, we kind of touched on a bunch of different things. We talked about science communication. We talked about scientific literacy. Uh, we talked about um, your background, uh, why you got into the big debate, uh, the kind of... Uh, what, what we, the reason I got into the big debate... Go ahead. Um, more. ...was basically my, my friend... I mean, when, when the God Delusion came out, uh, it was everybody was reading it. Uh, I was I was curious at the time, but uh, would wait until somebody else read with their book, and I, and I could borrow that. Uh, but my mate gave me uh, this book for my birthday. I read it, and I was absolutely horrified uh, about the the evils that religion perpetrated. So of course, I went on to. Um, the 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 interwebs 
as they say, and looked at for looked at some of the uh, stuff on, on atheism and fundament, fund, fundamentalism and stuff like that. Uh, I then was sponsored to do a, an MPhil uh, at Manchester University, and I met someone there called Brendan, who was more into this stuff than I was. So I, I chatted with him, and that started to get my fires burning. So he suggested the sort of stuff that uh, to, to 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 actually look at and and stuff like that. And that's how I got onto watching the atheist experience which is a wonderful wonderful program and from then I got on to visiting the uh, the Matt Slick website called calm.org and uh, interacting with some of the nut jobs there uh, and <laughs> <laughs> the nut jobs totally neutral language I appreciate that I, I, that it's only the way that I can possibly explain these people, um, and I, the the actual stupidity uh, and the arrogance that they asserted their stupidity was just was just jaw jaw dropping. Um, there was to 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 give you an example, um, there was a guy who thought that as photons of light and waves of light went into your eyeballs and then that got uh, interpreted in by your brain, that meant that the that your brain was lit up because of the light, uh, and uh, I and from that I, I just I just thought I. How long did it take for your synapses to recover from the explosion of nonsense that was blown through them? I some some time. I, I, I honestly didn't believe that people could be this ignorant, this uninformed, and so uh, resistant to actually educate themselves. They seem to to pride themselves on their stupid on their stupidity. Um, it was an utter shock. Uh, so after the calm website, I went on the Facebook. And started to talk to God on the slide. Started to join a few groups, and again, my jaw dropped even further of the of the amount of um, ignorant uh, creationists which asserted themselves with such utter confidence uh, that it just made me um, just so so dumbstruck. With just like, with just, I can't believe that these people exist. I really can't. So, I've I've made it my sort of hobby to talk to these people who have these outrageous ideas um, about their ideas on science and how they came up with, with these or where they read it or why they and why they believe it. Um, so that's why I like to talk to the fundamentalist nut jobs, uh, but they seem to avoid me like the plague. I don't know why. Me neither. Um, calling them nut jobs, of course, is one of the most high compliments that you can give them to endear them towards talking to you. <laughs> well, it's that. But I, I, and you, 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 oh man, you know that I'm, I'm, I'm busting your chops. Yeah, well, you, 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 you can either have me polite or you can have me honest. Oh yeah. Well, let's face it. When people want to have honest conversation and they want to argue the science and they want to argue it with a scientist, you've always left yourself open to talk to the people that want to have those kinds of conversations. And rarely do they take you up on it. Of the, of the amount of people that's cl that claim that they want to have that kind of uh, debate or conversation. Yes. Um, I, I, I've spoken to a, to, to a few, uh, and, I, and I want to talk to more. There's some, there's some guy who, who claims that science can't give you knowledge, which I found an absolute bizarre... Uh, point of view to to have, um, and there are other people who just 
bastardized science for their own religion. I'd like to talk to 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 do them. Do not too. so. And I'd like to clarify something because um, do you not think that the scientific method is one of many forms of epistemology? Well, uh, to gain knowledge, well, it depends what you want to gain knowledge about. Mm -hmm. If you want to gain knowledge about the natural world, then I think science is the only method that we have currently. But if you want to say uh, understand but, things like uh, Doctor Hunt, it sounds like you are saying that science is limited. To the natural world, I think. Perfect. I, I mean, uh, that's exactly the answer that I would have given. I just wanted to hear you say it, okay? And, and can you talk more about that? How is science limited to the natural world? Because it uses methodological naturalism. It only tests things which can be repeated uh, and observed and uh, things like that. So, and also, it also tips. Uh, tests the, um, the the predictions of of certain models, things like evolution. We can test that uh, the idea of common descent via uh, endogenous retroviruses, for example, um, would be a way to test for for common for common descent. So it's being able to test these things and and make these predictions and 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 and, and test them which makes science such a powerful tool to understand the world, the universe that we live in. But the natural world might not be all that exists. So when somebody comes to, uh, and, and we have to start wrapping this up, but oh man, you had to start bringing in the friggin' awesome sauce at the end, right? Um, so when, when, somebody, <laughs> when somebody has a personal philosophy, which is informed by science, but science is, like you said, merely a tool with which you understand natural phenomena with natural explanations. But that isn't enough to fulfill your metaphysical or philosophical questions. You're well, saying that science is limited. Well, it depends what what those metaphysical as, as a version of a as a version of epistemology, which was the original point. Uh, epistemology being the source of knowledge. Where do you get your or how do you a, get your a form of knowledge? Um, um, form the of knowledge. philosophy of knowledge, a, a form of knowledge, right? Okay. There is knowledge that can be attained from science that doesn't necessarily have to be absolute truth. It could be knowledge, uh, 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 provisional knowledge that you accept. To inform your worldview that you uh, in include well, within your, you know, cohesion yeah. Yeah. philosophy, I mean, things like that. I mean, I think uh, morality perhaps would be something that science can explain why we have morals, but it won't necessarily dictate what morals we should have. Um, for example, um, and then you have things like. Um, music, what makes music pleasing to you, what makes art pleasing to you, uh, what makes literature really started. <laughs> what makes literature pleasing for you, and, and it's, it's these sort of things which, which in my opinion science has, has nothing to say yes. it's, and it's basically um, and I think that's basically based on your upbringing, your experiences and all these sort of things uh, mashed in into one, so it's, I and mean, then you can't really analyze that scientifically. So that's, I mean, that's that's one thing. But, but if you want to know um, why the planets orbit the sun, for example, then science can answer that to the nth degree. Good point. Now I'm going to have to uh, end it now because I know that a. Uh, uh, Bob Graves, the unconventional pastor, is getting ready to rock everybody's fat buttocks uh, for the next 55 minutes starting on the hour. And so we need to cut this. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hunt, thank you so much for talking. Uh, I need to get you back soon so that we can address a little bit more detail about uh, methodological and philosophical naturalism, a little bit more detail about um, scientific claims about aesthetics. I'll just leave that as a general category for the arts. Okay. Um, and, and emotional, uh, the psychology of emotion theories, um, which dip into the aesthetics component. I mean, because that's super fun for me. Maybe boring for others. <laughs>
But I think that you and I will have a great conversation, just like we did tonight, uh, or okay. like I did tonight. Okay. So, so uh, thank you very much for uh, your time, and I would like to uh, encourage everybody who is watching this right now, if you have not subscribed <clears throat> to the um, a YouTube channel that is broadcasting this, the New Covenant Group, I encourage you to do that right now. If you happen to be a Facebook user, and you didn't know that the home of the New Covenant Group is this place and page known as the Cult of Honesty. I just said it. They're a cult of honesty. Um, go ahead and become a member of that so you can join in the conversation. Further, there is another page on Facebook called, guess what, Meeting of the Minds, the name of this show. My name is Christopher Mowdy. My guest has been Dr. Matthew Hunt. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Hunt. Thank you for having me. Without a doubt. Everybody stay tuned for the rest of the programming for the New Covenant Group. Take care.